Good to see you. I appreciate the opportunity to be back for a second consecutive year uh, to talk a little bit about the state's um, finances. Um, it, it strikes me that when I gave this uh, presentation a year ago, uh, we were in a quite different situation. And I was um, speaking glowingly about our rainy day fund balance and how we had about 9% of operating expenses tucked away for a rainy day. Um, and I think my final slide was a list of um, uh, threats and challenges, things that could undo us. And um, I talked about, you know, the if the federal government ever got serious about deficit reduction or um, and things like that. But uh, the last one was whether this little thing we we're starting to hear about called the coronavirus was going to ever get serious. Um, and, you know, it was partially tongue in cheek, but um, it was, it strikes me that it was um, perhaps inappropriate now that we look back at it. So, um, Look, I appreciate the opportunity to come back in a much different era. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, Fred, are you going to let me share? We'll get that squared away in just a second, Michelle. Um, so ultimately, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the. Uh, You're ready to go now. I am. There we go. OK. You're going to go here. All right. And as it looks like, it's a slideshow. Yay. And I used um, the symbol for pi at the bottom there. None of the math is that complicated, I promise. Because if it was, I couldn't do it. Um, so what I am going to talk about um, is where we are in this in, in the budget process, how we've gotten here. We're going to talk a little bit about our revenue projections um, for the next two fiscal years um, and a little bit of history of our state revenue. I want to talk a little bit about um, the appropriations um, that have been presented by the governor for the next two fiscal years, as well as some of the authorizations of, of other revenue and uh, talk about as we go into the upcoming legislative session, some of the complicating factors that we're going to have to deal with from a fiscal perspective. Um, so there's going to be a bunch of dates on this next slide, and I apologize for that. But I, I think it's important to highlight how um, how long the budget building process is for state governments. If you, the original direction to state agencies from the governor finance, governor's finance office went out in March of 2020. It went out pre-COVID um, shutdown to start preparing budgets for fiscal years 22 and 23. We hadn't even gotten to fiscal year 21 yet. Um, and it's, 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 it's a, quite a process over that time. That direction tell, tells them um, how to build their, their base budget structures. Um, they take um, basically double legislatively approved amounts um, for the fiscal year and uh, adds, you know, add roll up costs and maintenance units and inflation and things like that. And that's how they, um, that, that was the overall direction they were given. Um, those budgets were due um, to the governor's office in September of this past year, um, and they were ultimately made, made public uh, October 15th. Um, and those agency request budgets, and I'll highlight this a little later, totaled about $9.7 billion worth of um, general fund expenditures for the next two years. Um, in December 3rd, on December 3rd, the Economic Forum um, met and offered its revenue projections for the next two fiscal years for the state. The Economic Forum is a five member panel that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. They project revenue. Uh, we have this, um, this, this third party do it so that um, the legislature doesn't play politics with our revenue numbers uh, and uh, decide that we want to create a new program that's going to cost some money. So we just dial up a, a revenue projection a little bit. Um, that's not how we do it. The Economic Forum uh, makes its projection um, in, uh, the, in December. Uh, the governor is then bound by those numbers um, in his budget. Uh, the, the Economic Forum comes back, as you'll see here, um, in early May, and the legislature is bound by that projection um, when we close the budget at the end of the legislative session. So um, just uh, this past week, January 18th, uh, the governor's budget um, was um, due to be released to the legislature. The governor's budget is statutorily required to be transmitted to uh, the legislature uh, 14 days before the start of the legislative session. Um, the governor then gave his state of the state the day after on January 19th, and we are now in uh, pre-session budget hearings. Um, actually, the one on K-12 education just started a few minutes ago, um, and I'm playing hooky, so don't tell anybody. Uh, 
the um, these were, we're gonna have pre-session budget hearings. We had them three days this week. We'll have them three days next week. Uh, the legislative session starts February 1st. Uh, we're gonna get an update on our economic forum projections, as, as I said, on May 4th. And May 31st happens to be the last day of uh, the 120 day legislative session this year. Um, it, it's This is only the second year since uh, we went to a constitutionally mandated 120 day legislative session that the session is going to end in May. Um, we have a much shorter timeline to get some of these things done um, than in other years. Um, if we start a little later, the economic forum um, update uh, is always in early May. So if we go through June 6th, there's a whole nother week of budget building time uh, that we get cooked into the legislative calendar. Um, so the, the, the time frame is pretty short uh, for this legislative session, even though it's still 120 days. So um, talk a little bit about our general fund. Uh, and th this is this is where we get the most flexibility for our dollars. Um, it, it obviously is not all the money that we spend, but it is the tax revenue that we collect as a state that the legislature authorizes and approves. Um, so just in the in, in the past couple um, years, for the 2018 um, and 2019 biennium, um, we had general fund um, revenue of 8.3 billion dollars. Um, when the legislature closed out. Um, the, um, the session in 2019, we had anticipated general fund revenue of just over $9 billion. Um, when the economic, when the, when the economic uh, impacts of COVID-19 were truly felt, we went into special session this past summer and um, revised our spending with anticipated biennial revenue of $7.8 billion. So we, we saw about a one point, almost a $1.2 billion um, anticipated reduction in our general fund revenue due to the uh, economic crisis brought on by uh, COVID-19. That was never fully realized. Uh, we never dropped that low, um, but obviously the, the impact has been significant. Um, the Economic Forum um, reprojects um, current revenue uh, or, or current biennium revenue during its December forecast. And so the, the economic forms forecast for the current biennium is actually $8.8 .8 billion now. Um, so it was originally down to nine, the special session, um, we were estimating 7.8, the economic forum is now estimating 8.8 .8 for the current biennium. Um, and finally 8.507 for the two years that are, that are gonna follow. So we're gonna see a biennial decline um, in actuals by 300 million or so um, and about 500 million when you look at uh, what we were anticipating from two years ago when we were in legislative session. Um, the economic, the, the state's general fund revenue is broken up um, by these main sources. Um, sales tax remains uh, the single largest source of general fund revenue for the state, uh, which is almost 29, uh, almost 30% of our total state revenue. Um, interestingly, this is the first year that uh, the second largest uh, revenue stream is the modified business tax. This is the tax that was created during the 2003 uh, legislative session, and it has grown over time in significance for the state's revenue and now uh, qualifies as the second largest general fund revenue uh, for the state, outpacing uh, gaming tax revenue. Um, and then uh, uh, insurance premium tax um, is another major um, another major piece for the state um, that we have one of the highest insurance uh, tax rates in the country. Um, and then uh, the, the, the commerce tax, which was created in 2015, is uh, the fifth largest um, general fund revenue stream for the state, coming in at just under uh, 5%. Um, and that's held pretty steady um, for the past couple of years. I think I passed. Nope, I didn't skip. So th this is um, sort of a trajectory of what our um, what our general fund revenue has looked like um, since the 92-93 um, biennium. And I know it's a little bit of a messy slide. That's because I built it. Um, but it, it shows that we've had fairly significant um, general fund revenue growth um, from, um, you know, bi biennium over biennium um, with some with some dips in the middle uh, over time. But what I think is uh, important to remember is as we've gone from a $1.8 billion, almost $1.9 billion general fund revenue budget um, in 92-93 to where we are now at $8.5 billion, um, and is the, 
the real value of those is, um, is, is not commensurate, as I'm sure you all fully understand. If you look at this chart, again, this is messy. Um, I didn't build this one, but it's, uh, you know, if you look at the green line on the top, that is actual general fund um, revenue increases indexed off fiscal year 1990. So if you look at the far bottom left of this chart, you're seeing uh, our, rev, our, our state general fund revenue dollars um, indexed to 1990 at 1.0, and it grows substantially with the green line. Uh, you'll see in the, the, the large hump in the middle here, um, this is the um, out, outcome of the, modif of the modified business tax being implemented and then economic growth after that, um, followed by um, another spike um, in 2015, um, we're seeing economic recovery and commerce tax growth, as well as some other taxes that were increased here. And um, current projections put um, that index back up above 5.4, uh, almost 5.5 uh, versus uh, 1990. Um, and there are a whole different, a couple different ways to cut it in the middle. But if you look at the bottom line, this brown line along the bottom, um, this is adjust, adjusted for per capita um, inflation and, um, or I'm sorry, adjusted for inflation and, and per capita population growth. So um, it, while our revenue is, is obviously significantly increased as a state, the purchasing power of our tax structure is ultimately the same as it was in 1990. If you look at that index of 1.0 in 1990, in 2020, it is ultimately the same, and it's going to drop a little bit below that based on current projections, um, a lot of which is due to uh, COVID-19. So um, the uh, getting into a little bit about the spending plan um, that's been presented to us for the next two years. Um, again, as I said, agency request budgets came in at about 8.6 or $9.67 billion um, based on the instructions that were given to uh, those agencies by the governor's finance office. Um, obviously, based on the anticipated revenue from the economic forum, um, the governor has presented a budget um, that totals about $8.7 billion, a little bit, a little bit less. Um, and that $8.7 billion is, uh, is an actual reduction in state general fund expenditures of about $187 million versus what the, uh, the legislature approved two years prior. So uh, we're talking a, a lot of the time when, when government talks about cuts, we talk about cuts in growth. Uh, this is a proposed actual uh, cut in general fund spending. The last time we did that was 2011, uh, which was my uh, first year in the Nevada legislature. Um, so with a, um, with a general fund budget of just under $8.7 um, billion, um, the vast majority of that is going to the two programs that I'm sure you're um, sure you're aware 46 and a half percent is going towards education that is both k-12 and higher ed and 37.6 um, percent is going towards health and human services over that time um, you know when you add public safety um, into that equation um, those three programmatic areas of state government account for about 93 percent of all expenditures so if you're reducing um, the state state spending, you're doing it primarily in education, health and human services and public safety. Um, we receive an awful lot of money from the federal government, um, not as much as we probably should, and that remains a point of contention. But, um, you know, our total budget, uh, when you add in all revenue sources, is about $31.4 billion. And you can see the dramatic shift in um, how that is spread out over programmatic areas. Um, because if you look at total spending, um, education is only 22%, but the, um, but the health and human services category increases to half of that total amount, uh, primarily due to uh, Medicaid and the federal government's share of, 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 of Medicaid costs. Um, they pick up about 62% of, um, of, of our overall cost for Medicaid. For a couple of key issues that we're going to have to be dealing with when we think about some of these budgets, um, is and, and primar primarily in K-12 education, is uh, a transition in how we fund K-12 that was approved during the 2019 legislative session. 
to what we call the pupil centered funding plan. And um, this is a transition away from the historic Nevada plan that we've used to fund K-12. And uh, this would move um, ultimately to um, aggregating all revenue into the state and then distributing it on a per pupil basis with weights for uh, additional need for at risk students, primarily those um, who are who live in poverty, who um, do not adequately speak English uh, and um, are at risk in, in, in multiple categories. Uh, the governor's proposed a partial transition um, to this model. Um, and I think that there are some, um, some, some significant questions about how that's going to work um, when, uh, when it's not fully implemented. So uh, I think we, uh, th there's a lot of discussion still to be had on that. We're sort of starting that this morning in this pre-session budget hearing. Um, but this transition is going to take up a lot of uh, energy of the legislature this session as we deal with our K-12 education funding plan. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the main talking points in um, the, the passage of this people centered funding plan was that uh, ultimately the Nevada plan was kind of a leaky bucket. It's a, it's a mixed funding system. It's a, we have a sort of shared responsibility model for funding our K-12 education system with primarily what we call local money and, and state money. It's all authorized by the legislature. I don't know why we call it that, but we do. And um, so as some of these other revenue sources like the local school support tax, local property tax increase, we historically have backed general fund out of our K-12 education system um, as, as an offset. Um, and um, there's a, always been frustration by that. Um, and this, this transition to this new funding plan was supposed to offset some of that. Um, and maintain general fund expenditures for K-12 education, but that is that has not happened. We're anticipating significant growth in um, some of these additional revenue streams, and um, the governor's proposed backing about three hundred and thirty million dollars in general funds out of the K-12 education system. Um, higher education is also looking at another substantial cut um, in the governor's recommended budget, about one hundred and two million dollars. This is primarily through uh, hiring freezes, um, as just some 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 sort of blanket operating cuts as well. And um, so those are gonna have to be dealt with. Um, we, we all know that higher education took a significant hit during the special session, um, a disproportionate hit during the special session. Um, they were able to offset some of those. And I, I believe that both with K-12 and higher ed, uh, it is the governor's hope that um, some of the federal stimulus money that's gonna be coming in will offset some of these cuts. Um, but we have not yet seen how, um, what some of the strings are going to be attached to those dollars. Uh, and I, I worry that um, the expectations and the hopes that are going to be put on the system of higher education are going to be um, significantly undermined by this level of reduction. There are certainly some good, good things happening uh, within the capital infrastructure proposal made by the governor. Um, for higher ed and pr primarily at UNLV funding the, the, the new UNLV engineering building um, as well as fulfilling the state's commitment to a contribution to the UNLV medical school building. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I don't have it listed, but I'll mention it as well. The governor and the state of the state proposed um, carving the community colleges out of the Nevada system of higher education. Um, I don't think he adequately or and perhaps even tried to explain what problem he was trying to solve in that um, in that brief uh, moment in his um, state of the state speech. Um, I will look forward to that. I think we've come a long way in um, in transferring articulation between our community colleges and our universities, and I would just hate to see um, that fall apart. So I'll be I'll be paying close attention to that. Um, in health and human services. Um, you know, as, as is probably no surprise, we have um, a, a significant number of people in this state who have been damaged by, uh, by, the, by the impacts of COVID-19 on our economy, um, particularly in the service industry. And we now have one in four Nevadans enrolled in Medicaid. Um, and that's obviously an income tested program. And uh, I think it speaks to the significance of uh, the, uh, the, the damage that has been felt by our economy particularly to vulnerable populations. Uh, we heard yesterday as well, 60% of all births in this state are covered by Medicaid. So six out of 10 children born um, are to parents who, um, who are in Medicaid. Um, the general fund increase 
to this program is about $285 million. It's almost, you know, verging on 10%. That, that also leverages up uh, a lot of federal money. So it brings, brings more federal dollars into the state. But um, as a contrast to what we saw in K-12 education, a lot of those dollars that the governor moved out of K-12 are getting put into um, health and human services overall. Um, there are a few, um, you know, other things that I think are, are really important to note. Um, the uh, the state's capital improvement program, um, as proposed for the next biennium, is strong. It's got a total CIP of four hundred ninety one million dollars over the biennium. We um, tend to look at that uh, as um, where we uh, ultimately it's a pretty much a jobs bill, right? We are spending money on construction, um, ensuring people get to work. Um, and that is, um, so that $491 million is the total general fund amount. It includes $372 million in general obligation bonds um, issued by the state, uh, which is um, the highest that it's been for quite some time. And the treasurer presented um, uh, yesterday, I believe, might have, been, might have been two days ago um, to the legislature about um, why that why we have such um, such strong bonding capacity for the next two years. Obviously, the costs of borrowing are low. We're all but primarily we're, we're retiring a whole bunch of bonds um, and giving us additional uh, capacity within our limits. Um, we have um, some pretty strong constitutional limits on how much debt we can um, we can have out there, and then obviously um, these are secured by our the state's 17 cent property tax rate. Um, so um, we can also only um, issue as much as we can afford uh, with uh, those anticipated uh, property tax receipts. There are additional uh, one shots in the governor's budget. These are um, these are expenditures that. Uh, are one time in nature. So we tend to use one time money for them. We're not going to put them in the general operating budget. So um, there are about $226 million in one shots. Uh, this includes um, things like the $25 million um, uh, contribution to the UNLV Medical School. This also includes $44 million in, um, in, in a commitment to shore up the Governor Quinn Millennium Scholarship Program. Um, the the funding streams for the Millennium Scholarship do not uh, don't suffice, and we've been using general funds to shore up that program um, for about a decade, and um, the problem is getting worse. And the forty-four million dollars is certainly a hype mark in how much the state is going to commit to, in general funds to continue that program going. Um, uh, interestingly, part, part of that driver for the next two years is students in, in anticipation of students returning home to Nevada and um, being qualified for uh, the program still. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rollout of time that students have to use Millennium Scholarship money. And if they went out of state for their first two years and they're coming back because um, uh, coming back to Nevada and going to enroll at UNLV or UNR or one of the other schools, um, they have access to that program still to, to help cover that cost. So um, that's that's one of the big things driving up that cost. Um, an interesting part of um, what I thought was also included in the governor's budget is um, a con we have a, um, a statutory requirement that we transfer 1% of anticipated revenues to the rainy day fund um, to help um, bolster our, our rainy day fund account. Um, based on anticipated revenues, that would be about $85 million over the biennium. The governor has recommended um, continuing that transfer and depositing $85 million over the biennium into the rainy day fund. Um, you know, I was not anticipating that considering the, the, the level of some of the cuts that are included in his budget. Um, and, and he's also draining the existing $100 million that is in our rainy day fund um, to help shore up our expenses. So um, it, it's sort of a put and take. Um, but when after the legislature gets done, I wouldn't expect to see um, that full $85 million still in the rainy day fund for the next two years. Um, so as I get close to wrapping up here, I've just got a, about five minutes left. I want to talk about a few um, sort of complicating issues that we're going to see as we as we process the governor's recommended budget for the next two years. Um, and the first is federal stimulus. The uncertainty um, is hard to um, hard to explain in some ways. The we work on such a regimented timeline for approving uh, the state's biennial budget. 
Um, we have dates marked out on the 120 day calendar over when we um, close all of our hearings, when we start closing budgets, when we start resolving any differences that we have between legislative chambers. Um, and all of these things are scheduled out well in advance. Um, you know, that May 4th economic forum date is really critical for us because that gives us our final our final revenue numbers. Um, and all, all of this discussion, as I said, as I said earlier, is now going to be, be compressed into what 27 days. Um, and it's really complicated by by the level of um, unknown uh, federal stimulus dollars that are going to come in. When are those dollars going to come in and what level, what types of strings are attached? Are they going to be flexible for the state use? Are the vast majority of them going to be pushed down to local governments um, like school districts and counties and cities that are responding to the, to the um, coronavirus crisis? So with, with a lot of that unknown, um, I think that it's entirely reasonable that you're going to see the legislature making adjustments to the budget into the summer, maybe coming into special sessions and um, making some significant adjustments when we have um, significant issues. I think it's clear at this point that we're going to be in special session in the summer anyway to deal with redistricting um, because the federal because the Census Bureau is not going to be um, able to get us the data in time. So um, I think this process is going to be extended out um, into the summer and uh, we just need to probably accept that and move on. The missing billion um, dollars, that's the that that's what I'm calling the gap between agency request and um, and uh, the governor's recommended budget. That is um, if <laughs> I don't know if President Sandoval is listening, but I do know that if he had proposed um, a budget that was a billion dollars less than what his agencies requested, it wouldn't be presented quite as rosy as uh, I think Governor Sisolak's getting um, on some of this. Um, there are, there are significant um, challenges in the governor's recommended budget. There are cuts to mental health, cuts to education, cuts to higher education, um, cuts to services for um, children with developmental delays. Um, and we're going to have to look at all of this and see uh, how much of it is realistic, how much of it is tolerable, and if there are uh, ways to solve some of these problems. There are two um, major um, tax proposals coming to the legislature in the form of a ballot question from the Clark County Teachers Union. One would raise the state sales, statewide sales tax rate by a point and a half, and the other would raise the top tier on gaming properties. Um, I don't expect either of them to pass, but they're going to complicate the tax discussion um, if there is one due to um, the fact that they will be on the general election ballot um, come uh, November 2022, no matter what, there's no way for us to prevent them from being a ballot question unless we were to pass them and implement them as law. Uh, I think both the speaker and the majority leader of the Senate indicated last night that they don't anticipate them passing, but they don't agree with them. Uh, I would agree with that. I don't think they're, they're the right, um, right proposals for the moment. So um, those will be on the ballot. There are also three um, constitutional amendments to change mining tax policy um, that were passed during the special session that will be coming back to the legislature to cons for consideration. And um, so all of these things are going to complicate that fourth piece, which is any revenue proposals. There are, there are talks about implementing a new digital tax. Um, there are continued talks about property tax uh, reform and how to how to more adequately um, get our tax structure broadly to reflect the economic activity that's happening in the state. So um, those are going to be all complicating factors as they as, as they often are uh, walking us through the legislative session. It is now 915 and I'm going to have to wrap up. So I will uh, say thank you. Um, I wish I could take questions, but Fred said no. So you can blame him.